Okay, good morning everybody. So we're going to start this morning um, continuing the session that started yesterday on planets, on the search, formation, evolution. And our first speaker will be Gilles Chabrier talking of the formation of uh, planets versus brown dwarf. So oh, attends, attends. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for getting up so early near the end of this fantastic conference. So before we get started, let me have the pleasure to introduce my eminent colleagues, Marcus Jensen, and as Hansen Roman Rafikov has the pleasure to write this chapter with, who are supposedly all in this room now. Uh, so the very aim of our chapter is to try to, uh, to, to, I mean, to focus on this blurry domain between brown dwarf and giant planets and to compare uh, observational constraints with uh, formation scenarios to figure out whether we can uh, infer some uh, formation mechanism for these guys. So uh, let's start indeed with the brown dwarfs and let's take a look at various observational uh, constraints we have today about these bodies. So first of all, what about the brown dwarf mass function? What this diagram is about, it's the uh, number density of brown dwarf as a function of decreasing effective temperature, increasing J magnitude, whatever. I had worked out almost 10 years ago in 2004 for Edsel Peters' 80th birthday conference. And what I did this time, I said, let's assume that the mass function I worked uh, in the stellar regime extends all the way into the brown dwarf regime and it's find out which kind of a brown dwarf census we should have above our heads. And at the very, uh, right before the conference, Kitty Cruz and Neil Reed were kind enough to send me the updated uh, trigonometric paradox J band they had in the neighborhood. So I was able to renormalize that 2003 function, and this is the very uh, end of uh, the, uh, the, the main sequence, the stellar regime, so the hydrogen burning limit is right here, and it changes the normalization, but it's already changed. And I calculated the expected uh, bound of census in two cases. In the case you resolve the binaries, which, which is what I call objects, in case you don't resolve binaries, it's what I call systems. And at, at this time, and I went all the way down to the opacity limit fragmentation. And at this time, I barely had a handful of objects to compare my predictions with, which were namely, I mean, mostly coming from Alan Burgess's uh, PhD thesis, and, and the Dirobas were huge. And down the road uh, came a couple of uh, other large scale surveys by Medchef and Celine Rainey at the CFH. And even though the Dirobas were still substantial, uh, I mean, the predictions seem to be, let's say, on the right track. And what, most interestingly, a few months ago, uh, David Kirkpatrick and collaborators released the first results of the WISE survey, uh, which is exploring the coolest objects in, uh, in the solar neighborhood in the field. And I mean, uh, honest, I mean, I, I would say that the agreement with the prediction of uh, Chabrier 2005, uh, mass function extending all the way down in, uh, to the hydrogen band, uh, to the, the opacity limit fragmentation, was doing a pretty good job, pretty good agreement with Kirkpatrick. There is something I want to point out right here is that if you use this mass function, which is a log normal, nothing, absolutely nothing changes all the way from 100 solar masses down to 1 Jupiter masses. You don't have to adjust anything, good or bad, you don't change anything. If you try to fit all these guys by, power, by a series of power laws, you'll have to invoke many power segments, which doesn't mean any, uh, which doesn't have any scientific background, whereas log normal does. Uh, so I urge my observer colleagues to get rid of these uh, Alphas. So but the story is by no, by no means over. I mean, uh, I mean, I've been told it's, you know, maybe off by a factor of two or three. I'd be perfectly happy about that. But if you take the gross picture, say, means that basically having the same stellar mass function extending all the way across the uh, hydrogen burning limit does a pretty good job having predicted the census of, of, of brown dwarfs today. Uh, there, I want, there are two points I want to stress then. The first one is that the wise survey sensitive to the solar neighborhood, meaning the thin disk population, and meaning ages of the order of one giga year. If you take any model, 
models, the Leo models, uh, some of Marley models, the Tucson models, you'll find out that one giga year old objects cooler than 500 Kelvin must be smaller than 10 Jupiter masses below the determined burning limit. So the wise survey tells us that we do have non determined burning brown dwarf around our heads. The other point I want to make is that for those of you who are completely addicted, suited to power those cells, this is what an alpha equals zero, dn over dm equals constant will predict, meaning that below this temperature, which is about the, the order of 30 Jupiter masses, the number of objects decreases with decreasing mass. Okay, this is something to bear in mind. Okay, uh, so now, I mean, if in the very same. Uh, uh, proceedings, uh, conference proceedings, I had worked, I, I predicted roughly that the ratio of brown dwarf over stars would be one brown dwarf for three to four stars. Right now, the Y survey is, which is part and incomplete, is one to five. So again, nothing is, uh, you know, final, but, but I think it, it is fairly consistent with, with this kind of mass function. Um, okay. Now, let's take a look at clusters and star forming regions. Now we have more than a dozen of star forming regions and clusters uh, in which we go well into the brown dwarf regime. And all, most of these clusters, with some scatter at two, three sigma limit, of course, all agree with the very same lying IMF, which is the very same galactic IMF I just mentioned. Nothing drastic happened at the hydrogen burning limit, right? Uh, last but not least, I want to stress that now there is growing observational evidence for the uh, for free-floating brown dwarf below the determined burning limit. Okay, so that's the very point I wanted to stress. Now, let's take a look at the multiplicity frequency in the stellar and brown dwarf regime, just a fraction of, of, of brown dwarf companions and whatever. And if you add up the spectral binaries discovered by Vicky Jorgensen at all, I think the, it's fair to say that I do not see either a striking discontinuity near the hydrogen burning limit, but rather something which smoothly decreases uh, with decreasing mass. Okay, uh, but I think the most striking results in terms of brown dwarf formation we, we had recently were these fantastic observations by Philippe Henry and collaborators at the Plateau de Bure Interferometer where they do see a collapse, a pre brown dwarf core which is isolated, no nearby star, no disk, no host star, no whatever. And, and, and Philippe, who is an extremely careful person, has Plateau de Bure and Iram uh, observations. And these guys were able to, to nail down the, 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 the size, the mass, and, and there's the density of this pre brown dwarf, and it's definitely in a brown dwarf regime. So it tells you that we this shows that indeed brown dwarf can form from the collapse of a pre stellar brown dwarf core consistent, for instance, with the Grau turbulence scenario. That's, of course, a very interesting result. But now, uh, there is no way I can go from the exhaustive comparison of brown dwarf and young star properties, and I strongly recommend the community to read these fantastic reviews by Kevin Luman, the PP5, and the annual review. But very quickly, we can go down this table, and what I'd say that young brown dwarf and young stars shares the same radial velocity dispersion, the same spatial distribution in young clusters. They follow basically the same trend. As we just saw, they're all consistent with the same lying IMF. We do observe wide binary brown dwarf. What brown dwarf do form in very low density environments, such as stars, for instance. I mean, brown dwarf show signature which has a natural extension of what uh, you, you know for classical tutorial phases. The disk fraction, accretion, whatever properties of brown dwarf are very similar to the ones of stars. We do have uh, observed, Reggio Warden and Kerberos observe a lot of outflows around brown dwarf, and as we just saw, uh, we do have now growing evidence of isolated proto and pre brown dwarfs. So, you know, by all means, I have absolutely no dogma. By all means, we must keep an open mind. But, but since I'm a very simple mind person, I think the uh, most natural, naive conclusion of all what we've seen so far is that basically, I would say that brown dwarf and star formation seem to be sharing the same dominant, I'm not saying it's the only formation mechanism, but it looks like you don't have to invoke a, a, a special formation mechanism for star. But, but for sure, the jury is still out. I'll come back to that. Later. What about giant planet observations?
Again, let's turn to uh, observations uh, first. And first of all, uh, there is now enough statistic from radial velocity surveys to say that the giant planet frequency is strongly dependent on the metallicity of the whole star. The larger the metallicity of the star, the, the, more, uh, the more likely you're going to have a, a, a planet companion. And this kind of a trend strengthens as you decrease in mass, meaning that if you go to low mass stars, meaning low mass disks, I mean, with solar metallicity low mass stars, you barely have any giant planet companion. Only very metal enriched low mass stars do have giant planet companions. And I would argue that this is expected from the gravitation scenario, but hardly from the disk gravitation stability scenario. I'm, I'm sure my, my next colleagues will be happy to, uh, to disagree with me, and it's fine. Uh, I'm afraid it requires a little bit of fine tuning. But uh, you know, again, let's keep it in mind. Uh, the other trend we have from the observation of planets is that the number of uh, planetary companions increases with decreasing mass, right? Okay, this is in stark contrast with what we just saw for the brown dwarfs. So these, you know, around 30 Jupiter mass, uh, roughly speaking, the number of brown dwarfs decreases with mass, whereas the number of planets increases with decreasing mass. Two striking different mass functions, meaning two striking different formation, dominant formation mechanism. Again, I would argue that that is indeed expected from the equation scenario. It's easier to make a small planet than a big planet, right, in, the, in this kind of scenario. Now, what about statistical constraints from dark imaging? Uh, for sure, with some caveats, for sure. But if you look at the results by Lafreniere et al., you'll find out that less than 23% of stars have a companion, could it the way you want, larger than two Jupiter masses within something of the other 450 AU. If you go up in mass, less than 9% of stars have a companion larger than five Jupiter masses. Uh, you know, within 500 AU or so. So uh, Marcus worked out the statistics, and basically, right today, uh, we, we could say that less, 10 less than 10 percent of stars host Jupiter mass objects at wide orbital distances, which could be formed by disk instability. I want to stress that in Marcus' analysis, Marcus considered both possibilities to form planet giant uh, gravitational stability and correction. So, of course, we, we, we must stay tuned, but I doubt that these numbers will change by orders of magnitude, but, but certainly they will improve in, in the near future. There is a problem, though, with the correction scenario for plant formation, uh, and if you look at this uh, remarkable paper by Roman, you'll find out that for minimum mass solar nebular conditions, it's fairly difficult, it's basically impossible to build uh, a giant planet by correction within 40 AUs or so, because the time scale will be way longer than the light, uh, lifetime of the disk. Yet, we do observe uh, planets at, at, at these orbital Sensors. And that was a big issue until recently, until these two gentlemen who are both in the room came to our rescue, and we, we heard about it a little bit yesterday, and suggested the payback accretion mechanism. And to make a long story short, and again, the inventors are in the room, uh, if you, uh, you know, in the planet, standard planetesimal accretion scenario, the accretion rate is just a fraction of the flux entering the heel sphere. And basically, this fraction is a ratio of the planet radius over the heel radius which means a factor of 1,000 at Jupiter's orbit. If you go to pebble accretions, pebble do spiral inward uh, onto the planet embryo, and you get rid of this factor. Meaning, if you do the calculations, pebble accretion speeds up conformation by a factor of 1,000 at 5 AU, Jupiter's orbit, and 10,000 at 50 AU. So cores do form well within the lifetime of a protoplanetary disk, even at large orbital distances. And I urge you to take a look at this excellent poster by uh, Michele Anbrecht and collaborators. Do pebble accretion scenario has some observational support? Well. As a matter of fact, two days ago it did. You may have seen this paper in Science uh, where people do see, and I think Keith Dulmont is involved in this paper, the observation of what's called a dust trap, where you have an accumulation of, of pebbles uh, in the domain between about 45 and 90 AU. So pebbles, by all means, are present in the outer part of protoplanetary disks. Whether they will eventually accrete or not is still an open question, but at least they're there. 
Another interesting object, though, is a GJ504B. This guy is about 3 to 8 GPU masses, 40 AU, so, uh, orbiting a very metal enriched but twice solar uh, star. Can this, how can you possibly form this object pebble accretion? If pebble accretion works, by all means, you can do that by pebble accretion. But you can also do that by in situ accretion with a standard uh, revived uh, co accretion scenario that Roman worked out in, uh, in, in, in these two papers. Can this object form like gravitational instability? Why not? However, I have two concerns in that case about GI. First of all, uh, the, the, this, this, this disk is going to be very metal rich, meaning very opaque, so it, it will take forever for it to cool. That's, a, that's an issue, so it will be stabilized with a pressure gradient. Uh, last, and, and number two, uh, the more massive a disk, the more rapid the inward migration. So it's by no means trivial to keep this body right there without having him, you know, just going straight into the star. But okay, what about formation theories now? So the first formation theory I want to focus on in the so-called disk fragmentation theory, which applies to, or has been suggested both for brown dwarf and giant planet formation, and the main proponent of these theories, uh, uh, the people above. I don't want to go through the GI again. I mean, Joe Ford did a fantastic job uh, two days ago presenting this, this theory, but you have to remember that in order to form fragment, not only the disk must be massive enough, meaning, you know, uh, fulfilling the turmeric criterion, but it must be cool enough, so you must have a massive and very extended disk. If not, you will never form fragments because they will never get bound. Okay, how does it compare with observation? Uh, again, a couple of years ago, three years ago, Anna El Mori and Philippe Henry collaborators uh, took, I mean, took a look at this scenario. So what they did, what Anna El did, that she took the uh, output of numerical simulations coming from three different groups, namely Stamatelos Whitworth, Matthew Bate, and N. Beltessier. The two first ones, Stamatelio and, and Bate, are pure hydro simulations, no magnetic field, whereas the N. Beltessier uh, 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 simulations are MHD simulations. And then I worked out the synthetic images, disk images, and compare with the observations of five disks at this time in Terrace and Perseus. And if you look at the hydro simulations, they all predict very massive and extended disks with a lot of fragments, which by no means agree with the observations, whereas the observations do support the MHD disk, as we heard a couple of days ago by, by Lee's talk. Uh, so again, it's by no means a proof yet. Uh, I know Anael has more data now, so we are eagerly waiting for the results. But I honestly think that it's fair to say that today, massive and extended disk prone to fragmentations are not observed from now, for now. Um, however, we do observe isolated, massive, compact disks around class zero objects, which are consistent with MHDCs. Indeed, this kind of a disk could be unstable, but I would argue, because of the accretion, it's accretion-driven instability, I would argue that they enter directly in the nonlinear phase of, of instability, but the accretion doesn't last very long, and in all cases, most cases, all the fragments, if fragments form, quickly fall into the central star. So this is definitely an issue to be uh, looked at more carefully, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it, that might be the explanation for the uh, episodic accretion, even though you don't have to form fragments for the episodic accretion. Instability is enough. Anyway, so again, so uh, now what about gravitational uh, instability for planet formation. Again, to make a long story short, short, and I recommend this remarkable paper by Roman, in order to fragment and form a planet, you have very strong constraints on the thermodynamic properties of this. Not only you want this to be massive enough, but you want this to be cool enough to be able to be gravitationally unstable. If not, you have a pressure support, but you don't want it to be too cool. If not, the cooling time scale will be way too long. So the, in, in, in the thermodynamic space, the region where GI is, uh, is, is possible, it is a fairly re small region. And if you work out the numbers, which interestingly enough, in which you have only the constant of, of physics, and this is just the Keplerian or epicyclic frequency with, where there is a mass ratio. All you, I mean, what are, it, it looks to me that it requires rather extreme these conditions for GI to be the dominant formation mechanism for giant planets. And as I just uh, mentioned, uh, 
for GI, you need a, a, a very massive disk, but then you have a gravitational coupling with, with the disk because you want you know, to conserve and get a mountain. So the more massive the disk, the faster the a fragment will migrate into the star. So again, it's by no, by no way trivial to keep these guys there uh, until they build up a gap around, uh, around them. Uh, OK, so now if I summarize the constraints of observations with respect to uh, uh, gravitational instability formation for brown dwarf or giant planets, so I would say first that, as we heard in this conference, I will not trust at all any, any simulation aimed at exploring this issue which doesn't have both a proper treatment of radiation and magnetic field because yeah, okay, okay. Uh, number two, uh, as I said, if GI was the main road's dominant formation mechanism for brown dwarf, you would expect most class zero objects to have massive disks. It's by no means what is observed so far. We have other constraints which come from low mass binaries, and uh, we have a bunch of objects like that. But let's take a look at this interesting body right here. This is a triple system. One of the, uh, of the stars is a low mass star surrounded by a brown dwarf companion, and you have the masses right here from Kepler's orbits, and you'll, you'll see that even if you say that the disk is going to be 10%, 20% of the low mass star mass, there is just not enough mass in the disk to have formed this brown dwarf companion by GI. On the other hand, if we go all the way on the other side, we do have now very wide binaries with projected separations larger than 1,000 AUs. There is no way you can form these guys by GI. And last but not least, as I say, we do have now building statistical constraints on GI coming from direct matching. And basically, right now, uh, basically less than 10% of stars uh, are likely to have, a, let's say, a Jupiter mass companion within something of the order of 700 AUs. And by all means, these numbers will improve in the near future, but I doubt, I might be wrong, I doubt that they will change by an order of magnitude. What about the ejection competitive equation scenario for brown dwarf formation? And uh, all the, uh, uh, no, Ian is not around, but all the other proponents of this scenario are supposed to be in, in this room. So again, to make long story short, in this scenario, you have a collapse of a cloud, and you form n cluster small body objects, uh, Jupiter mass or so, and these obj the objects will re which remain in the cloud will keep accreting and eventually become stars, whereas the ones which are ejected by dynamical interactions will be starved and end up their life being brown dwarf. In this scenario, dynamical interaction is essential to build the IMF. All stars must form in cluster, and the IMF is determined at the very late stages of star formation. At the gas to star conversion, there is no correspondence whatsoever with the CMF. There is no necessary CMF. The most advanced uh, simulations in this domain are the one conducted by my steel friend, uh, Matthew Bate, last year. We, so there is a lack of magnetic field, but you know, Matthew can observe everything at once. He does have radio feedback, and the striking result of this uh, paper is the resemblance between the IMF Matthew gets from the simulation and the Chabrier 2005 IMF. And I can promise I didn't bribe Matthew. I do have one concern, though, I met you know, about these simulations. Those are the initial conditions. Are these initial conditions realistic? Well, well, well. We do have observational constraints about the density and Mach number RMS velocity in solar neighborhood. And you'll find out that Matthew's initial conditions are about at least four times denser and four times more turbulent than the Larsen's radiation. So both conditions over favor, I'm not sure it's a proper English word, but you get it, over favor fragmentation and dynamical ejection. So I strongly suspect that if you go back to standard Larsen's relations, you barely will have any ejected embryo. But there is an interesting point about that, is that you can directly compare Matthew's initial conditions with a, with a two-day stellar cluster, not a cluster, cluster, NGC 1333, which is what has been done by Alex Schultz, Ray J. Ward, and Ed Collaborators. And whereas Matthew gets 190 solar masses under the form of star and brown dwarf in his simulations, the observations would go all the way down to you know, very, very low mass brown dwarf, just find a factor of four less, which strangely enough, it caused this factor of four both. So one, now the, the question is how come Mathieu does a pretty, such a good job, the simulation do such a good job reproducing the Chabrier 2000 IMF? Well, what I suspect 
What I suspect is, as a matter of fact, the IMF is determined at the very beginning of simulations. It's by all means something Matthew can check out because he's sitting in data. If I'm wrong, I will be most happy to sincerely apologize publicly to Matthew if I'm right. As a matter of fact, it does bring support to the government scenario. Other issue with the government scenario, which is by no means negligible, is that there are many observational constraints on the fact that pre- and proto-stellar cores have a very you know, really slow uh, velocity dispersion, meaning that the collapse time scale is way shorter than, than the collisional time scale. In other words, uh, you know, these pre-stellar cores barely, I mean, barely have any time to interact with their neighbor before up they collapse. I'm speaking, by the way, of the bulk of the IMF. I'm not speaking of the very massive stars. That might be another story, but for the bulk of the IMF, it's definitely a very strong constraint. Uh, there are other issues with the competitive equation ejection scenario, and which I think uh, are by no means uh, negligible. Questions are how do you preserve the correspondence between the CMF and the EMF? How do you form brown dwarf in low density environments? The number density of brown dwarfs in Taurus is very comparable to the number density of brown dwarf in other clusters, even though Taurus is 1,000 times less dense than the other clusters. There is not even uh, space for n body clusters in Taurus, yet the number of brown dwarfs is the same. How do you preserve very fragile systems such as these the two interesting guys and I? Uh, I recommend you learn the uh, ID by heart. How do you preserve disk and outflows in this scenario? How do you end up having a universal, as we saw in all clusters, IMF, even though I think it's fair to say that Matthew may have an, an explanation. How do you form brown dwarfs in isolation, such as a few tau A and B, for instance? Not all stars form in clusters, and we now have uh, evidence of at least some isolated massive proto brown dwarf and pre brown dwarf cores. So those are by no means negligible concerns about this scenario. You know, okay. What about the gravel turbulence scenario, which I think was first theorized by our two friends Paolo Padoan and Okanodun, who are in the room, and, and Patrick and I worked out a different theory and Hopkins uh, theory, which is similar to the Henbel and Chabrier one. Uh, again, in this kind, in this scenario, what happened that at the very beginning, you know, in large scales, you have supersonic turbulence, which shakes up the cloud and, and generates a, a density field of over dense regions by, by cascading by shocks because it's compressible turbulence. And then I want to stress that this is what happens at the very beginning of star formation because it's something which has not been clearly understood or explained by us in, with Patrick. And then once the job is done, Turbulence dissipates. It's, that's it. Turbulence is no longer there. But the job is done. You do have the imprint of these other dense regions at all scales. And, and for, I, for sure now, I mean, filaments might make the story a little bit more complicated. I'm not quite sure I might be wrong that they will change drastically the gravel turbulence picture as whole. And the, in these other dense regions, the ones which are dense enough for gravity to take over all other supports eventually collapse. So in this scenario, turbulence sets up the, in, the initial density fluctuations at the very early stages of star formation. And the IMF derives from the CMF and is imprinted at the very early stages of the cloud property, Mach number, Larsen's relations. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, we do not have so far uh, numerical simulations exploring this gravel turbulence scenario. So all we can do is to compare the theory, for example, we worked out with Patrick, uh, with the Chabrier 2005 IMF. And as you see, for proper Larson relations, I mean, the agreement is, 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 reasonably, I mean, is, is really good, reasonably good, ex including in the brown dwarf regime. The number of predictive brown dwarf is similar. It's by no means a proof. It doesn't mean that the Embel Chabrier theory is correct by any means, but I I don't think it can be completely wrong. Uh, so what about now, uh, again, the uh, summary of the gravel turbulent fragmentation scenario? Well, it, it, it explains naturally the fact that the IMF resembles the initial CMF because for sure, I mean, Everything comes from the very early stages of star formation. It's already imprinted in the cloud properties. It naturally explains the universality of the IMF because everything depends only, only on the power spectrum index of turbulence, which is a, 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 a universal uh, property, and of the Larsen relations, which, is, as a matter of fact, derive from turbulence. 
In contrast to what has been said uh, in some papers, it can lead to binary properties which are consistent with observations. I recommend th this paper, and I will come back shortly on this part. Interestingly enough, good or bad, it can explain both within the very same theoretical framework, the mass function of unbound CO clumps and the mass function of bound cores. Uh, this theory would be in a very bad shape if fragmentation was, was you know, ubiquitous at the early stages of core formation. Even though we, by all means, must you know, stay cautious, it seems that fragmentation, of course, seems to be limited at the early stages. One, two, three, I mean, a core fragment in one, two, three pieces, which is not going to change the IMF by all means. But most interestingly, there is emerging a uh, sample of observation of isolated proto brown dwarf and pre brown dwarf cores. And this poster was around a couple of days ago, so it adds up to, to, the, to, 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 to the list. And as I mentioned earlier, there is this pre brown dwarf core observed by, 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 by Philippe André. Uh, so again, using Ockham's razor, uh, I think it's uh, that the double turbulent scenario, seem, which supports the fact that brown dwarf form like stars, seems to be, uh, you know, not excluded, say. Okay. Uh, so what about binary properties? I know this is something Hans is found about. And he, 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 so this is by all means an, an important issue. Uh, so the honest answer, at least, for me, is that so far I do not have any uh, explanation, and it's definitely something which has, we have to keep in mind. To keep in mind, but I think there are, there are some evidences for fragmentation, formation of binaries at the very early stages of class zero. Uh, and as, mar as, as a matter of fact, it's, if you think about it, when you st when a core starts uh, collapsing, the easiest way for it to get rid of its angular momentum is just to split it in two parts, you know, binaries. And interestingly enough, if you look at the average distance of the white binaries we have today, basically they have the same size as the size of a stellar core, something of the order of 10 to the 4 or a few 10 to the 3 uh, AUs today, right? Uh, so again, this is by no means a proof yet, but it's definitely an interesting issue. And, and uh, uh, it is, you know, consistent with the predictions of uh, some sim uh, numerical simulations like uh, done by uh, Ian and Matthew. Uh, uh, boy, we're getting old, almost 20 years ago. And, and by your excellent uh, Japanese colleagues. So it's by all means something we have to closely uh, take a look at. So now, if I as a matter of fact, I was so scared by my chairman that, uh, uh, <laughs> that I speed up too much. I'm sorry, guys, if I shake you too much. Uh, okay, well, first of all, Conclusion number zero. Again, we must keep an open mind by all means. We're all scientists, right? We don't care about journalists. We care about science. So I would say that it's, I mean, at least to me, it's too premature today to really have a definitive answer. You know, uh, the jury is still out. But I think there is, we, it's fair to make some comparisons today at the PP6, and, and which, which is what I kind of summarize right here. Can stars and brown dwarfs form dominantly, dominantly, I stress that, by gravitational instability or competitive accretion ejection? Well, so far, it's, so far, it's not supported by observations. As, as I mentioned, it faces, these, both scenarios face many issues compared with observational constraints. The IMF, according to both scenarios, should vary appreciably with the environment. It's not what we see. By all means, with all the respect I have for Matthew, and I definitely does have a lot of respect for Matthew, uh, I don't think so far the numerical simulations which uh, have been devoted to exploration of these uh, issues are not relevant for Milky Way-like molecular conditions. But GI might be producing some objects, for example, in very in circumbinary disks, I meaning very massive disks. Even though you can form these guys by, G, by accretion there, you possibly can form them by GI. Why not? But we're, we're talking a very small number of objects. What about gout turbine fragmentation? Do you think if the theory has something correct in it, the advantage that this very same theoretical framework yields predict the very same uh, CO clamp mass function and bound core CMF, uh, by all means, there is an emerging population of isolated pre and pro bond dwarf cores. Isolated, no hostile, no companion, no whatever, right? By all means, the core mass function to final initial mass function still to be fully understood, but all simulations do show these magnetocentrifugally 
driven outflows at the second core stage, uh, uh, which is, you know, which gets rid of most of the angular momentum, and uh, which is along the line of uh, the theory suggested by Matzer and Chris McKee. Uh, by all means, binary formation of the first and second core stage uh, must be fully understood. Uh, it's honest to say that the scenario, as we heard in the fantastic talk uh, by our prize winner a couple of days ago, might be uh, more complicated than we think, and I certainly strongly recommend that you go back to Shuichiro's uh, paper, which does include filament, and in the chapter by Philip. So, by Philip. So again, we must keep an open mind. The story might be a little bit more complicated than we thought. Uh, but independently, independently on any theory, I think it's fair, because I know most of you don't like theorists, uh, I think it's fair to say that brown dwarfs and stars share many similar properties notably the IMF, right? So again, using you know, my best uh, Occam's razor, I would argue that brown dwarf and star formation shares the same common dominant mechanism. But it's by no means only one second, but like 80, 90 percent, it seems that the overwhelming majority of these bodies are formed the same way as stars do form. Ejection, disfragmentation, photoevaporation might play some role at some point, but I don't think they are not, it's been shown that they are not essential for brown dwarf formation. What about planets now? The overwhelming majority of discovered exoplanets so far are consistent with prediction from Clark Question. I think we should take this opportunity of this conference to pay a tribute to Peter Benheimer, who is one of the initial builders of the Clark Question scenario and who should be in the room. I've seen him this morning. Uh, and for instance, if you look at HAT P2B, 9 Jupiter mass planet, had be 20 b 7 Jupiter mass. These guys are so dense that you have to put 200 Earth masses of heavy element into these guys, which is just a factor. It's, it's four times, five times of our solar, nothing drastic. It's exactly the same enrichment as Jupiter and Saturn. But there is no way you can accumulate as many uh, heavy element by, by crack question, even if you invoke migration and, uh, and uh, accumulation, whatever. Formation by gravitational stability requires very particular, not to say extreme conditions. Adding migration and uh, whatever, I think to me looks a, makes the problem even more acute. It requires a little bit, a lot of fine tuning. It looks a little bit like the epicycles to me. But, you know, again, let's, the jury is still out. Even if gravitational stability occurs, it's by no way trivial to avoid inward migration of the form fragment. GYI, however, might be operational at very large uh, orbital distances in some situations. However, as we've seen, the number of objects at wide orbital distances is very rare, less than 10 percent. Co-accretion might be working there if the pivot accretion scenario is confirmed. And there are, there are, of course, other possibilities, as we heard from a uh, uh, few speakers uh, a few days ago. Outward migration, as we heard yesterday from Sean, planet scattering, whatever. So by all means, we must stay tuned. And by all means, future projects, Sphere, GPI, Caris will definitely help. And I will argue that direct imaging, to me, is really the future of exoplanet astrophysics. Now. This last part, I don't want to include my dear collaborators in this last part of the talk because I don't want them to take a chance to jeopardize their young career. But my career is already made, so I, I have already many people who hate me, so I can add up one more bunch of people. So uh, that's going to be a little bit controversial, but you know that I like that. Okay, if you look at this body which uh, Marcus pointed to me, Kappa NB, it's dangerous striding the time burning limit, yet, the mass ratio is one person. So this guy got to be a planet. It cannot be a brown dwarf. And again, it's dangerous. It's striding the germ burning limit. On the other hand, this body right here has a mass ratio of 20 percent. So it is a four Jupiter mass brown dwarf orbiting a 20 Jupiter mass brown dwarf. So this guy doesn't burn the term at all. So we do have the proof that non dotting brown dwarfs do exist up there. So please, guys, stop calling them names, strange names. These guys are just non burning brown dwarfs. The same way you have non helium burning stars, non CNO cycle stars, whatever. You don't give them names. So why do you want to invent names? To make the first page of the, of the New York Times? Doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, and 
on the other hand, nothing prevents the term burning planets, as we suggested with Isabel a few years ago and worked out by uh, our friend Mark Davini and, and Peter Bodenheimer at all. So that would be a very interesting uh, issue. So uh, again, but if you have something to take home from that, brown dwarfs and giant planets do the do two domains do overlap in mass with two different mass functions around 30 Jupiter's masses. There is no strict limit between these two bodies. Deuterium burning plays no role whatsoever for brown dwarf formation. So the AU definition, I don't know if my friend Alan is in the room. I mean, uh, he, maybe he didn't want to come again. Uh, but I mean, it, OK, it's, it's a semantic definition. But from the scientific point of view, it has absolutely no background. It's completely meaningless. And I believe it's very confusing. So question is, now, key question, how can we distinguish a brown dwarf from a giant planet is a non determined banning limit? If the body is free floating alone, I mean, it, there is 99.99 .99 chance it's a brown dwarf. The occurrence of planet ejections is very rare. Ask Alessandro Morbidelli. It's by no means trivial to eject a Jupiter mass body outside the solar system. So at the PP5 meeting, we suggested uh, that uh, if you have a, a companion which is, you know, in the brown dwarf giant planet regime and you don't know at wide orbital distances, you don't know what it is, we suggest that it if it forms by cry question, it should be, you know, metal in which and you should, maybe we should see that from its, uh, from its atmosphere. So again, direct imaging will definitely help. But this diagnostic has to be confirmed. It's by no means trivial at all. Uh, but it's the uh, best diagnostic we can come up with. I don't have time to... Uh, in, uh, talk about the hot south cold south, but okay, I'm almost finished. And okay, so now, so again, I think I I if you go back right here, uh, we I think brown dwarf and and, and Japan form differently. If we can identify the two guys, fine. If in some cases we cannot say whether it's a brown dwarf or a planet, I think the only honest scientific answer is just to say, I do not know. We do not know. And I will stop here because I don't want to upset my chairman and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jill, for this very punchy talk and uh, don't worry, everybody does not hate you, yeah. So... <laughs> 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 okay, uh, I suspect there is uh, many questions, so let us start on this side. Uh, uh, so we have uh, Yana Liber, Uni Bern. Uh, so first I would like to uh, thank you for the talk for a very uh, narrow-minded guy. How did you say for, uh, yeah, you, you said you are, uh, what was it, a narrow-minded or something like this, an old guy, it was very exciting. No, a simple uh, mind. Simple mind, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, I have a question, in fact, uh, related I mean, to what you say, and it's also a question maybe for uh, Chris Hormel on uh, this people equation, because you say that uh, planets that form by uh, GI, they have danger of being lost by migration, right? Uh, but I think it's the same for uh, planet formed by people accretion because they form very fast. So don't you think that they will have the same problem that if you form a planet by uh, people accretion at 50 AU very fast, it will be lost by migration exactly as a GI planet? I, uh, again, the, the, the most... Uh, uh, the best answer uh, can be provided by, uh, by Anders rather than by me, but I would argue that the people, the people accretion, if it works, still takes longer than the gravitational instability will occur right away, right? So, so there is no way you have time to, to build a gap. In the paper accretion scenario, you, you, the, I mean, you just accumulate the objects right there until eventually they, they, they go enough to... Uh, uh, and it's basically going to be a nice giant. So... So I don't, so, 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 so I don't think it's time. Okay, okay, okay. You had your chance, Jan. <laughs> Let's go there. Kevin Hing. Matthew. Matthew will have a chance I also, but I I'll just... Okay. Hi, Kevin, go. Kevin Hing, Ben. Uh, just a comment on your last point, which I actually like. So we, did a, we just put out a study of a retrieval analysis of HR 8799B. We were asking the question, if we are agnostic about formation and evolution, and we simply ask, what's the radius and surface gravity of HR 8799b based on the spectrum alone? We get a very weird answer. It's a small radius, it's a large gravity, it's metal rich, it's non solar abundance, and the mass is 16 plus minus 4 Jupiter masses. 16 plus minus 4. 
it's, it's still something you can build with car question mm -hmm. standard. Right, but it, it, is, it is interesting in the context so, of your last statement sure, in sure. no, so, so That's all I wanted to point out. So keep us on it. It's by definitely interesting, sure. Okay, on this side. So a natural question to these two formation mechanisms is where do they meet up? At what mass? Well, that's, uh, the, uh, as I said, uh, I would argue, I would say that the brown dwarf mass regime will end up anyway at the opacity limit fragmentation because in that case, the core becomes completely opaque, adiabatic, it cannot fragment anymore. So the mass, you know, according to uh, uh, Calculations is of the order of a few Jupiter, one, two, three, five Jupiter masses, and and it's big, and, and I mean, Wise is getting there. Okay, so hopefully for the PP7 we'll have nailed on this fundamental issue about star formation. On the other hand, where does planet formation stops? I do not know. I do not know. I know that, for instance, Christoph Manazzini and Uncle Bridos uh, can form a. Uh, uh, a, a giant planet by crash, crash cushion up to something of the order of 20 Jupiter masses. And, and, and basically, we, we, we need to confirm that with better statistics, but uh, definitely it's overlapping. Okay, in the back over there, yeah. Uh, John Tobin, NRAO. I want to make a comment about the class zero disks. I don't think that we have solved whether or not large, massive disks exist in the class zero phase yet. One out of five of Mari's objects was found to have a disk with a radius of 100 AU. And we saw another example uh, from the poster session, Nadia Murillo found VLA 1623 to have uh, a disk of something like 100 AU. And we also see evidence of fragmentation on the scale of 100 AU consistent with disk fragmentation in some new results. So it's. It, I think uh, all my upcoming observations with the VLA are needed to really solve that problem. Okay, you're absolutely correct. We must keep an open mind. When I took a look at your poster, I, I found out that the mass ratio of your disk is about 3, 7 percent. So it doesn't look like gravitation unstable disk for me. But, but, but you're absolutely correct. Let's keep an open mind. And let's look. When you say we have evidence for gravitational uh, instability at large orbital distances, I, I do not really understand how can you make sure it comes from GI. But, well, but it's uncertain yet, but we do have, but they do lie in the expected plane of the protostellar disks, and we do see a circumbinary disk around at least one of them, or evidence for a Oh, circumbinary disks? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, but what, what we are seeing is dust emission f around each source, so that. Okay, oh. okay, okay, let's go on. Yeah, just, okay. Are there any questions up there? Yeah, okay. Does it work? Yeah, talk. Just talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I do. Let's say concerning the concerning the form, uh, formation of uh, of planets at, at large distance by by uh, pebble accretion, this is actually an, an interesting possibility. But I would like to have your, your feeling about uh, the the formation of of those planets just more deeply inside by more or less regular core accretion, and that suffered some uh, some di dynamical instability scattering even that just put, put them on, on those orbits. You presented the case of the formal hot pla B planets. There is a, a recent recent work concerning, concerning this uh, this object. There is a poster by, by Paul Callas there showing that this object um, uh, is actually orbiting over on a very eccentric orbit. So it's quite likely that it suffered some, suffered su such an event. You're absolutely correct. As I said, I mean, as we heard yesterday from Sean and other people, I mean, planet scattering might play a role. And I want to point out the suggestion by Roman Rafikov in two excellent papers in 2004 and 2011, I believe, where, where he has this uh, kind of spinning fragmentation process of CA, where possibly it can work in that case. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Matthew. Uh, Matthew Bate. I, um, think, I think I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Both at Exeter, that's right. Thank you for giving such a balanced and unbiased review. <laughs> I, I can only hope that it appears on YouTube to be pre preserved for posterity. Can, can you flick back to your uh, conclusion slide for the competitive accretion model? Competitive. Uh, what? Competitive accretion model. This one? No? Uh, go back a bit further. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm not sure where Keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Up, uh, Up. A bit further. Sorry. I think. This one? Competitive accretion. Competitive accretion. Uh, 
So where? Uh, I well, do, do you? Re I would like to yeah. go on. So <laughs> yeah, well. it should not take too much time. What, what's the point? The, the, well, just what, just the one showing your your. <laughs> I'm not sure which one you... The, the objections to the competitive accretion model. Ah, okay. Did, did I upset you? <laughs> no more than usual. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, okay. Well, yeah, take, 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 take. Okay, this one? Yeah, that's okay. good. Okay, so the first question, you don't. Uh, the second question... Um, you form brown dwarfs in low density environments by dynamical interactions in small groups. The second one, you form wide binary brown dwarfs via simultaneous ejections from small groups, just like is shown in my papers. Um, the third one, uh, presumably you have small disks and outflows around brown dwarfs. There's a very nice poster of showing uh, evidence for a 5 AU radius disk around an M star which also has an outflow. So I think small disks from ejected brown dwarfs and low mass stars are perfectly fine. Um, how do you end up having a universal IMF? As I understand it, BAIT 2009 gives a mechanism for a universal IMF, it's whereas right. the uh, Hannibal and Chabriot model is not a universal IMF, I think. Uh, how do you form brown dwarfs in isolation? Um, again, uh, that's a binary brown dwarf system which you can form via ejection. Uh, last one. Okay. Stars must form in cluster. Okay. okay. Perhaps uh, I've made my point. If you, I, if you, so one more. If you flick back one more slide. Okay. No, no, we are not, we're slide. not going no, to, to revise one, the. Talk. I don't want yeah. to upset my chairman. Remember. <laughs> yeah. Flick back one more slide. I think. Matthew, I want to give the chance Just to other wait. people to ask their question. Okay. So uh, okay, the initial no, conditions. I, so the initial conditions are exactly as observed in infrared dark clouds as shown by oh. the observations of Sarah Ragan. And if you dark. come and see me after, I can show you the observations on my laptop. Okay, what about this one? Okay, but anyway, yeah, but is, is your laptop the real Milky Way, Matthew? That's, that's a key question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mordecai, you're waiting for a long time already. Okay, thank you. Mordecai Macklow, American Museum of Natural History. So, I agree that you can form isolated stars by single cores collapsing, but around a massive star, the accretion flow required to build a massive star is so dense that you cannot avoid gravitational instability in the flow, and that explains naturally that massive stars are almost always, at least, accompanied by low mass stars. But you can't do one core, one star that way. Could be, could be. Okay, this will be the last question, so I choose, and you will be the one. <laughs> Sorry, Gunter, but... No, 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 you, you ask the question. Uh, so, in the mass functions of brown dwarfs... Sorry, is this on? Yeah, in the mass functions from brown dwarfs uh, that you showed from uh, young star-forming regions, it looked like there's uh, some variability or a variation between the regions. Some of them followed the Chabrier IMF, but others uh, looked flatter in the brown dwarf region. Uh, do you think this variation is real, or do you, uh, and is it significant? Well, I mean, the other sensor is, is not, cannot come from me. It can go from my colleagues' observers. I will not bet my salary on these objects. And again, I recommend just taking a look at these uh, uh, these, uh, sorry, uh, 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 sorry, uh, I don't want to go too late, but I, I think there's an interesting point made by, uh, by, by Kevin, which is that, um, okay, I just want to flash up this, this, this slide that I brought from one of Kevin Luman's talk, uh, where you have to be very, very, very careful when you reach, you know, very faint objects because the odds that you get contaminated by, by background stars are by no means negligible. So, you know, I, I would not bet a lot of my uh, salary, so to speak, uh, on the very bottom objects yet. You know, we're getting there. But. Okay, so thank you very much. Sorry, but we have to stop here.